Thank you very, very much. I have thoroughly enjoyed my time meeting you and learning about your industry. I am absolutely excited to tell you about my program and my industry that we deal with because I think that my job is one of the best jobs in the world. So I want to share that with you. Uh, whoops. Um, one of the things that uh, Patty didn't tell you is that um, I started my career with the U.S. Department of Agriculture in uh, 1987. And I was a field veterinarian medical officer dealing with the export of cattle across the, uh, the pond. So uh, that was my primary duty as the port veterinarian. But one of the minor duties that I was responsible for was dealing with animal welfare inspections. And shortly after I had started my career, the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service did a reorganization. And they said, anybody in the organization interested in doing animal welfare inspections and animal welfare issues full time? And anybody who said yes, maybe, was sort of drafted into that. And I was the one that said yes, I really do. So we started out with a really small field force of about 80 employees uh, originally starting out. And I was one of the original group. Uh, and I've been doing this for 26 years, and it's been a wonderful growth in my career. And I've progressed in many of those uh, positions. So I did field inspections for 10 years. So I actually did the um, inspections going to the facilities and, and enforcing the Animal Welfare Act, and then became a supervisor, and then an assistant regional director, and then after Katrina did some issues relating to uh, developing our part of the program and emergency programs, and then moved up to be assistant deputy administrator. And I want to talk about this fantastic program that is um, really kind of hidden from the public view because we do such a great job that it's not, it doesn't generate the same controversy that other issues generate, except when there's negative issues out there. Well, all right, I have to figure out how to make sure I'm doing this right. We are a very small program within the government. There's only about 225 of us total uh, that run this whole program. Uh, the animal, and one of the things that Patty asked me to talk about is um, help you understand how the USDA animal care program fits into the whole hierarchy of the USDA. So often, you know, people, you know, point to the USDA, but as you noticed, um, it's a very diverse organization in itself, and so we're very small, and we're, my program deals with two laws, the Animal Welfare Act and the Horse Protection Act. But this is how we're divided, and we have a lot of technical expertise in our uh, employees. Uh, we're in a couple of different areas, but I'm very proud to say that we have technical expertise dealing with not only the industries that we regulate, but also the types of species of animals that we regulate. Um, we have a person which many of you may have talked to, Dr. Gerald Russian, who deals with breeder issues, dealers, and transporter type issues. Uh, we have a person who deals with all kinds of exhibitor and marine, marine mammal issues, as well as a technical specialist that is board certified in zoological medicine that deals with marine mammals and exotic big cats. Um, I have a um, staff officer that works for me, and she's board certified in laboratory animal medicine, and she deals with all of the research facility issues, whether it is biomedical, uh, whether it's uh, pharmaceutical industry or educational um, university, she helps us deal with all of those things that we regulate that are affecting the research community. Um, one of the interesting persons is uh, Dr. Jolene Briscoe. She deals with birds. And uh, several years ago, the Congress changed the Animal Welfare Act to say that um, rats, mice, and birds not used in research need to be regulated under the Animal Welfare Act. Well, the population with rats and mice is fairly small that that would affect, but it really opened up a whole new vista for us to have to deal with birds. And so we now have a person on staff who's helping us to deal with that whole issue, interact with the community. I think I've met several people who've met Dr. Briscoe and have recognized that we've got some technical expertise that is concerned about making sure that we're uh, interacting with the industry appropriately. 
We also have a biophysicist um, who has done a lot of research in the past on mega herbivores, so rhinoceros and elephants out there in Africa. And so he deals, he helps us deal with the thermo, uh, uh, thermo regulatory issues that animals are experiencing in either zoological environments or the breeder environment. So whatever the regulated community is dealing with, we want to make sure that the, the uh, thermo neutral zone that the animals exist in is uh, comfortable for them. And, uh, helps their well-being. We have an elephant specialist, non-human primate specialist, and, and a dog and cat kennel specialist. So we've got a lot of technical expertise that we draw on to uh, interact not only with our inspectors, but also with the regulated community and the public. After Hurricane Katrina, we had, uh, we were the only part of the federal government that had any expertise dealing with companion animals that are affected by disasters. And so we were developing an internal program of about four people now that are focused on assisting states and local uh, um, communities in developing their disaster plans for the safety and well-being of companion animals and service animals. So we do a lot of collaboration and um, liaison work with those uh, emergency managers of the states and the local and the cities. Um, one of the things that people hear a lot about are compliance inspections. The majority of our employees are, are field inspectors that actually go to the facilities and do those compliance inspections. And what we're doing is making sure that the the facility is meeting their side of the agreement with the government to comply with the details of the Animal Welfare Act or with the Horse Protection Act. So just kind of tell you, this is how we're, we're kind of divided. We're, uh, our headquarters is in Riverdale, Maryland. Uh, it's near College Park, Maryland. Uh, and we have regional offices that do a lot of the support for our field employees. We have one in Raleigh, North Carolina, and the other one is in Fort Collins, Colorado. And then we have a new uh, department, which is the Center for Animal Welfare. And that is a non-regulatory component of APHIS, and it is to promote that communication and that dialogue, uh, discussion of scientific basis of animal welfare and, and animal related issues. To bring the different views together so that we can come up with a common solution or one that we can all live with. So we're excited that the Center for Animal Welfare is developing. Emergency programs, it started after Hurricane Katrina and one of the things that we do is interact with the state and local officials uh, we've sponsored a couple of major summits to where we've brought a lot of people together to discuss readiness. One of the things that we also um, have done is they've developed best practices in sheltering, in transportation of the animals um, in, from those disaster areas. And even with Hurricane Sandy, we've got our, empl uh, our employees interacting with many of the coalitions that are supporting the state officials in providing that support for their animals and their, their citizens. The other law that brings a lot of controversy is the Horse Protection Act. And this is to prevent that cruel and inhumane practice of soaring where they're adding either chemicals or mechanical devices to the legs and feet of horses to create a much more dramatic uh, gait, uh, the big lick. Um, the industry uh, was uh, the one that did it the worst was the Tennessee walking horse industry, um, and right now this is a very hot and very controversial issue for the department to deal with, uh, but it is one of the things that we're responsible for, and our field inspectors are, are the ones monitoring the industry officials to make sure that they're doing their part in enforcing the law. The one we spend, and then I spend a lot of my time on, is the Animal Welfare Act. And we are dealing with exhibitors and transporters, research facilities, and dealers. And these are some of the, the pictures of the types of environment that our employees are looking at and the animals that we're looking at. So under the Animal Welfare Act, the types of, of, of industry that we're looking at is about 6% of those that we uh, inspect are the transporters, that's the airlines, the trucking companies. 52% of those are the dealers that are selling um, either exotic animals or domestic animals, dogs and cats, rabbits, hamsters, guinea pigs, and such. 
30% uh, are, are, are exhibitors, uh, circuses and zoos, uh, the magician that pulls the rabbit out of the hat, the, the major zoo in Atlanta or nearby. And then 12% are about research facilities. Um, what I wanted to also share with you is some of the statistics of, that, of our activities. Last year, we did about 13,000 inspections total um, of animal welfare of our facilities. And 95% of our facilities are complying or exceeding our minimum standards of care for the animals. There's only 3% that have our, our significant problems that we really have to consider any enforcement actions against. So one of the, the fantastic things about my job is that the majority of the people we know care about their animals and we know that they're doing it right and they're also leaders in their own industry. So a lot of the concern and a lot of the issues relate to our, to our compliance inspections. Um, they are unannounced and that's because you, all facilities are expected to be in compliance at all times. And so when we drop in to do an inspection, it's just to determine that for that moment in time, we can tell that you're running your business appropriately and consistently. And the unannounced inspections are, are as uninvasive as possible to look at all of the areas that you're supposed to comply with. But it, it's also one of those things where we're not going to enter your property where we're not allowed to enter it. The inspectors are very clearly instructed that if the gates are closed, no one's home, they're not to go on their property. Um, it is required by law, by the Animal Welfare Act, that we do have to inspect research facilities at least once a year. Whereas all of the other compliance inspections are based on risk. If the history of, of noncompliance with the details of the standards is a pattern, we'll go back more frequently to those facilities, encourage them to make sure they're in compliance. If there's a history of they are in compliance, we're not going to be there as often. We always will document what we're finding on an inspection report, as well as taking photos to, uh, for the evidence if we're having to go for enforcement action. But we're also clearly explaining to the facilities what's expected, uh, what are the options for understanding how to be in compliance. Uh, there's a lot of discussion and a lot of understanding as to what they can do, what's needed for the animals. Our focus is on the well-being of the animal. It is not to run their business for them. It's not to create a to-do list for them. It is to focus on what is it that you need to do in your business for the well-being of your animals, which is also for the well-being of your business. What I wanted to show you is that you know this is sort of a um, how you can access looking at our inspection ports. We are a transparent organization. Uh, our inspection reports are posted online about 21 days after the inspection report is finalized by the inspector. That 21-day period is to allow us to correct any mistakes that we've made on the report, but also to give the facilities an opportunity to uh, comment on what is on that report. If we've made an error, we definitely want to make sure it's corrected. But we do post them online. Um, uh, and the annual reports that research facilities are, su are supposed to submit to us, that information is also available online. It's information that the government has. You can get any of our documents and through the Freedom of Information Act. The animal welfare inspections are the most requested documents of the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. One of the things it did would clog up the system of the Freedom of Information Act coordinator's office. When we made sure that the information that was on those reports was clear about what was found, it wasn't inflammatory to the facility, we were able to make sure that we could post them. That 21-day period is a part of the review process to make sure that information is not on that report that should not be on that report and publicly released. So you can go out to our website, and this is how you can access it. We have a very powerful search tool that allows you to get that data and that information any way that you want to. You can do it on one facility. You can do it on every facility in one particular state. You can do it on, on a whole group of facilities that are, have uh, marine mammals or those that have all the uh, tigers. So it's, it's one of those tools in which you sort of play with it. You get a lot of information that you'd like to know. Our, a lot of our great information is on our website. Um, you can get the current notices and, uh, about the issues that we're dealing with. Um, 
of course, you can get a copy of the regulations and our policies. Uh, the guidance documents that we have for our field inspectors is out there. We have an inspection guide for the inspectors that kind of tells them um, when you're at a facility, this is some of the guidelines that you're supposed to follow. So you have access to seeing that information too. Of course, uh, through that search tool, you get the, get the list of the licensees and registrants that are, are, uh, we're regulating. Um, you can also um, get a copy of the enfor recent enforcement actions that have been taken and what that whole process is. Um, a lot of the pet evacuation and sheltering information is also there. So we try and put a lot of our information on that website. I want to caution you that let you know that it is going to be undergoing a revitalization and a you know, updating of our website and our content. So uh, if you're having difficulty finding something that you're inter interested in, you can absolutely uh, email me and we can try and talk you through it. Uh, be patient, but hopefully by the beginning of the next year we have a, a more updated website. Now, I, I know a lot of people were very interested in knowing about the status of the current change to our regulations. And I wanted to make sure I covered as much of that as I could possibly cover with you. Uh, I'm not going to go through the details of the proposed rule. Uh, I'm pretty sure that those of you who are, are interested in and are following it know it probably better than I do. So I'm going to try and answer what I can answer as best I can. Um, it was to address the, it started out uh, to address the sales of dogs uh, over the internet. But it's a bigger issue than just animals through the internet. It's that the, the direction of the concerns that we received were that consumers were receiving these animals sight unseen and they were not, the animals had medical and genetic issues. And just to kind of give you a, um, a, a sort of a one on one in the way that we deal with issues, we work for everybody. We work for you, the public, the regulated the industries, the, all of our stakeholders, Congress and everybody else. And as issues come to us from whatever that direction might be, we will do our best to address and deal with that issue. It might relate to how often the issue comes to our attention or how dramatic it might be, but we still have to deal with that issue. And dealing with uh, the sale of dogs in all those kind of capacities is one of those issues that came to us. As you remember reading in the proposed rule, it came to us through our OIG audit, the Office of Inspector General audit made some recommendations that we needed to deal with the issue. The public was also providing them with complaints um, about animals that they had purchased that we didn't have at that time regulatory authority to deal with. We also were getting direct complaints themselves. And so one of the things that we do is figure out how can we best deal with this issue. We also have to respond to the Office of Inspector General's recommendations. So our answer was, okay, we'll look into it. We will do our best to uh, address it. This was the method in which we thought was the best way to deal with it at the time. I love the process that the government has because not only do we take all of the information that we can get to help us draft up the proposal, then the process says now we get to get more information that we weren't aware of. I am so excited that we got almost half a million comments, petition signatures on this topic. That tells me that there's a lot of interest, there's a lot of concern, and we have a lot more information that allows us to make our decisions best. So we've got all of those comments, they're reviewing those comments now. It is under development. Uh, I don't have any more information to tell you on that one because I don't know the, uh, the details of it. I reviewed the same comments uh, as much as I could um, that are on the public website, government uh, regulations.gov and change.org. So you have what I have right now. Um, the intent is to make sure that when we are publishing the final rule, uh, you can see your comments in the response. That's the intent. So hopefully with the diversity of comments that we receive from everybody, the general public 
the animal protection groups, the industry, that you'll be able to see that we did read your information and that we were trying to address it the best that we can. The other proposed rule that you might be concerned about uh, is the one relating to the importation of live dogs for resale. This was a change to the Animal Welfare Act that Congress made in 2008 with the 2008 Farm Bill. We are required to come up with the rules on how you can comply with that change in the law. So in last year, um, let me make sure I get my numbers right. September of last year, 2011, we published the proposed rule relating to this. And the requirement that was actually written into the law is that the animals must be in good health, they have to be at least six months of age, and they have to be appropriately vaccinated for them to be imported into the U.S. for resale purposes. It does not apply to the single, uh, the consumer bringing their own pet in or importing your own pet for your own per personal use. It's for those animals that are for resale. There are a few exceptions. Uh, if it was coming in for research purposes, uh, it may not be in, in good health. Uh, it might be for veterinary treatment, um, or if it's coming into Hawaii from <clears throat> Guam, New Zealand, the British Isles, and Australia then it doesn't have to have the age restriction. And that's what was written into the law. And so what we're doing now is where we published the proposed rule and we've gotten comments and now we're writing those comments to draft the final rule. And the last I heard was it's going through the departmental clearance process. So now we're getting permission to publish it in the Federal Register to let you know what the final decisions are on the importation of live dogs. And I'll answer your question in just a moment. So um, much of our information you should be able to get out there on the website. We are trying to definitely make sure that that's the place that we're sending people to. One of the new um, initiatives that we've got, um, we just started with the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service is using um, gov delivery for people to get notices about changes and information on our program. So Notify Me is a um, box that you can click on our website to where you can sign up for our registry. Anytime that we are publishing an enforcement notice or a change in our policy or uh, changes in our process, we'll be sending out notices. And it will have a list of topics that you can sign up for. Um, if you're only interested in marine mammal issues, then you'll get a notice that relates to marine mammals, but you won't get a notice relating to dogs and cats. If you're interested in horse protection issues, you'll get only the horse protection, or you can be clicking on all of those. It's how, whatever those topics that you're interested in. So I'm excited about that one because that's brand new, and we definitely want to stay in touch. We want to keep you informed, but we also have that opportunity where you can get in touch with us to say, well, uh, what other information do you have? So, now I'll be, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Okay. Uh, yes, the lady behind the pink. Okay. Um, I'm just uh, wondering if you've made any progress with the story issue. There has been a lot of progress where the uh, we've had a couple of indictments of the trainers that were involved in some soaring, um, and that was earlier this year or last year. Uh, we've got a lot of enforcement cases from the, the National Horse um, Celebration that happened this year that a whole group of people in the department are going through. So we are making progress. Um, it's a very complex way that that rule, uh, that, that uh, law is enforced because the industry has a level of responsibility to prevent those animals, those horses from being in that competition. And we're the ones that are having the oversight of the animals uh, and of the industry. So I, I, we think that we're making some progress. Hold on just one minute. The gentleman had his hand up. Uh, I had a question about the importation. Does that apply to rescues as well? Um, it does, we don't define what is a rescue. Uh, it uh, defines the activity itself. So if that animal is coming in for resale, 
then it would pertain to them if they are a part of that activity. There's several thousand animals come through the border into San Diego every year in this manner. They're, they're, they can be smuggled in the trunks of cars. Or they, I don't know how they're getting here, but they are getting here. They're young puppies. Some of them are sick. Some of them have other issues. So, but there, there's a market for them. Mm -hmm. We do talk with each other, and that one is a very interesting rule in which the uh, uh, we were required to collaborate with uh, Health and Human Services, so CDC, and with Customs and Border Protection in the development of this rule. Yes. Tell me if I t tell me if I repeat your comment correctly. Okay. Um, she was as I had uh, described the stakeholders that we deal with. I made the statement that the animal protection groups as well as the industry and the public are those in which we are responsive to. Uh, and she wanted to uh, clarify for me that the animal protection groups are not the same as the animal rights extremists. Okay. Uh, in, our, in my world, everybody's the same. <laughs> you might have different opinions, you might have different issues, and you may have different agendas, but in my world, I am responsive to everybody. I have to find a balance there. And, and so um, I'm not allowed to label anybody in, in, in what are based on their philosophy. But I do have to be responsive to what the concerns are that are brought to us. OK, the questions relating to why were cats included into the proposed change to the definition of retail pet store and why they were not included under the importation of live dogs. Is that the question? Yeah. Okay. The importation of live dogs was a change to the Animal Welfare Act by Congress. They're the ones that define the, defi the, the terminology and the limitations of what we would be developing regulations to. The, and that's a totally separate change to the law. The proposed rule relating to the definition of retail pet stores is dealing with what is excluded from regulation under the Animal Welfare Act. In, when the Animal Welfare Act was originally started, it was to deal with the concept of the brick and mortar store, one in which the public went into. There, there was some sense of oversight and how that animal was maintained before the, the person took the animal away. With the internet, that type of commerce is, became much more blatant of not seeing the animal before they received it. And so, when we are talking about changes to the current regulations, we're looking at what is it, what's the language that's already there. So the cats, hamsters, guinea pigs, and all of the small exotic mammals are, are already covered under the regulations and standards. So when we were changing the definition, we chose not to change the terminology of that definition, only to change the type of business model it was covering. So that's why cats and rabbits and hamsters and guinea pigs are, are, are a part of the regular proposed regulation.